when you when you watch it, was it accurate? And what were your thoughts on that? Well, um, the movie as well as the book captured the tone of the times pretty accurately. Uh, Tom Wolf as the author and and followed by the movie were off on two or three things they made serious errors on. Like Friends, uh, Gus Grissom didn't uh, screw up and lose his spacecraft because he screwed up, and it was proven that he did not. The movie kind of connoted that. The LBJ did the things that they showed in the movie, but he was not the dunce that they portrayed him to be in the movie. And our relationship with the German scientists, the Mercury astronauts and German scientists were very close. We had no problem on the relationship with them. And the movie portrayed that we were always having a big squabble with them. Speaking of movies, I mean, were there any movies that inspired you around that time? I mean, is there anything that you, you thought, wow, I'm going into space and this, this movie is, you know, was there anything that influenced your books, movies, literature, by any chance? Well, I'd always been an avid reader of Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, and I always felt that they were the sometime out in the future and be the way we'd see this universe. I think they always had kind of inspired me. But so far as uh, immediate books, one, uh, a lot of books that were written, or a number of books that were written, by the way, was Werner Von Braun wrote under Nom de Plume and wrote some good fictional fantasies. Speaking of that, I want to change some gears here a little bit. Um, in and we're doing two parts of the show. One part is obviously the space program. The next part is is like the 20th century kind of and beyond. And we want to know kind of your thoughts on, you know, everything for the future of mankind to the future of, you know, mankind perhaps meeting someone else in, in space or here. So I, as I understand it, in 1951 or 1950, you had a couple days of ob- observing something usual flying over Europe? Yes. We had some... Some kind of craft flying overhead at pretty good altitude and flying the same kind of formation we fly in our fighters. Were they planes? I mean, what? Well, it they... turns out they didn't have wings. They were saucer-shaped. And we never could get as high or as fast as they were, so to really positively identify them. But they were metallic-looking and saucer in shape. And they can do a few maneuvers that we couldn't do in an airplane. What what maneuvers are that? Like just horizontally displace themselves rapidly. Be flying along and just move over rapidly. And what, um, how fast were they moving? Well, faster than we could in F-86. And so they were, they were capable of accelerating very rapidly out, well past Mach 1 anyway. Did you think they were experimental craft, or, or what was your initial thought? Well, not knowing what was going on in Russia at the time, we were really at the height of the Cold War. We had no idea what Russia was doing, and we had no way of knowing whether they were Russian aircraft or whether they were something else. Um, after you were debriefed, what happened? Did they believe you? or? It didn't matter whether they believed us or not. The report went on, I assume, was forwarded on. The Washington. If you could speculate, I mean, on 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 what you saw and what they were doing, what would what would your I guess opinion be? That there were a number of extraterrestrial vehicles out there cruising around. Really? What do you think? I mean, what would they think we're doing? Were they were they monitoring what you guys were doing, or were they just? I mean, what would you speculate? Well, I would say they were going somewhere, traveling. Um, before this time, had you ever heard of any such incident like this occurring? No. Nothing. Mm-hmm. What effects did what effects did these sightings have on your life at the, at the time? None. None. It didn't. No. Lead you to believe? Oh boy, there's nobody made any big ditty about it. or really thought very much about it at the time. Um. You wrote a letter to the United Nations in, in May of 1963. What prompted you to, to send that letter? Well, I felt that everybody around the world was busy out being contacted from time to time and having sightings and a few abductions and various things going on. It would be nice maybe to have a central gathering house for all this information. 
and somebody who was some organization that was kind of neutral ground that wouldn't have uh, vested interest from country to country involved. And it seemed to me like the United Nations still would be the place to do a lot of this gathering. You mentioned abductions. What what were what exactly do you mean by that? Well, where people were, were blacked out for a period of time and woke up and obviously had some time missing and and down so far as uh, a couple of poor fishermen in Pascagoula, Texas, who uh, were actually taken on board a spaceship, extraterrestrial spaceship. And these types of things that whether you believe them or don't believe them or whether they're true or false, the information really ought to be brought together in one locale and properly investigated and properly correlated and properly stored. In your letter you wrote, I believe that these are extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews visiting from other planets. What led you to believe that? That's just my opinion. Your opinion? I mean, seeing, I guess for the first time, the craft did that, kind of prompt you to, to I mean, that I guess in your reading, Buck Rogers, <laughs> prompt you to, to believe that, that that's what the situation was? Well, in later years, after being in a fire outfit for a while and getting into aircraft development, testing research at Edwards, I certainly had decided that uh, they were not building that type of vehicle here, certainly not in the United States, very likely not on this planet. So these vehicles almost of necessity have to come from somewhere else. Um, again, referring back to a letter you wrote, um you wrote, uh, we uh, may first have to show them that we have learned how to resolve our problems peace by peaceful means rather than warfare. What led you to believe that? Was it just something that, I mean... Well, one would wonder why extraterrestrials are not contacting people more readily. Why don't they come and land in my backyard or somebody's backyard who would dearly welcome them and who would like to interface with them and like to find out what they're doing, what their propulsion system is. And, uh, and one would then take the next step and say, well, maybe it's because they don't feel we're ready. Maybe we haven't learned to control ourselves or learned to govern ourselves well enough to really be given more technology. What did you feel about the outcome of the letter or the results? I mean, what did you feel once, I guess, nothing happened? Yeah, I had nothing, nothing. The outcome of the letter was that nothing happened, which, of course, is rather typical of the United Nations. But would you write, if you had the chance, would you write the letter again? I mean, would you do it all over again? I suppose I would. I suppose I'd do it again, but even knowing it probably would be a waste of effort. Why, why do you think it would be a, a waste of effort? Well, it wasn't really truly a waste of effort. Uh, Kurt Waldheim reviewed it and had a meeting with us and looked everything over and and it was presented to the council and certainly made a lot of people aware of a number of things that uh, perhaps they had not been aware of before so maybe it opened a few eyes you said i just a minute ago you said the united nations would be the place to do that why why not some branch of the government i mean why not you know by the the, the military or 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 nasa or why the u.n well, then, uh, if, if our government handed it, there would be a few governments around the world that might have a reluctance to work with the program. If you had truly neutral ground like the United Nations is supposed to be, and he is pretty much so, it would be the logical place to do it. That makes sense. Um, I guess on, um, on the program Coast to Coast with Merv Griffin, you mentioned that you were previous to various... You need something? Oh, sorry. Getting in, the, getting in the lens there. <clears throat> you mentioned that you, I guess, were previous to various reports of UFO contact. I didn't know if that was first-hand information or you actually saw some sort of report or... Well, there have been a number of people who have been doing investigative reporting, and some good, some bad, and some indifferent, but, but there have been a number of incidents that have been pretty thoroughly investigated that were, I thought, quite interesting. Can you give me an example? 
mean, first, first of all, do you think they were credible? And secondly, do you have any examples? Or? Well, I think some of them were very likely credible. Uh, I don't have any specific examples that much better than the other. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where are we here? Um, what was the response to your parents on Coast to Coast? I mean, do you think you would do it again? Or, I mean, what was the public response? Were people interested? And were they like, wow, you know, we have an astronaut saying these. Well, I didn't have, my, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a fee over any direct result of it, but I know that Merv Griffin felt that he, he was one of the highest responses he'd ever had to a program. So he felt that there was a lot of interest there. I read also in doing research for, for this interview, um, there apparently was an incident that happened at Edwards Air Force Base. There was a film crew filming something. They came to you. They said, we've got some something on film that it was really neat. And can you explain what happened? Yeah, I had a film crew working for me on a project I was doing to put a precision landing system in on the edge of the dry lake bed. And they were filming the various stages of the installation. And a small saucer apparently flew overhead and put down some landing gear and landed out on the dry lake bed only about 50 yards out. And these were old pro cameramen who were used to flying in all kinds of vehicles to take all kinds of pictures. And so they picked up their cameras and started over toward it and going to get some close-ups. And, and with that, it lifted up, put the gear back in and at a very high rate of speed, disappeared. So they came in to tell me what happened. I told them to get over to the lab and develop the film immediately. And I would go and look in the book, regulation book, and see what you're supposed to do, who you have to call to report these kind of incidents, which I did. And by the time they got back with the film, there was a higher and higher and higher ranked man preceding the last one assuring me that I had to get those negatives into a pouch and that they had made arrangements already to get our commanding general's airplane reserved and take the films to Washington, which I guess happened. Did you ever see the film? I saw the negatives, yeah. And what, what did you see on the negatives? They were great, great pictures. Oh. Sure, they would have made great pictures from the negatives. What was it, a small, large? Fairly small saucer. It was hard to tell what size it was just in the picture, but it was a saucer-shaped vehicle. And you said it had legs? Land, land. It had landing gear. What color was it? Silver color. So what do you think happened to the film? I mean, what? I don't know. If I knew that, I'd be a very wise man. Um... We're just about done. We have maybe 15, 20 more questions here. Um, do you think the government knows more about this subject than we do? Do I think the government knows more about this subject than we do? Yes, I think they know a great deal more than we do. Um, why don't you think they say anything? I mean, why don't you say, hey... Well, I'm putting myself in the place of the government, say, and... Realizing the fact that in about right after World War II, I had started telling a few little mistruths because I was worried the public might panic over uh, knowing there was somebody out there that had so much superior performance to us, to any vehicles that we can build. So I tell a little mistruth, and then I, then later something else happens, I tell another mistruth that covered the first one. And I wind up with whole stacks of these little mistruths that get more and more and more embarrassing. And each administration, as it comes in, it's probably thought, well, gee, why don't we clean up this mess and admit to all of this, but how do I go about admitting it with the least embarrassment? And I think they're probably looking for a, a way of, with the least embarrassment of getting out from under all this, because eventually, you know, there's too many people to know what the truths are, and and they're going to have to confess up to having misled the public for a lot of years. Do you think they're doing it with, with, you know, mankind in mind by, you know, I guess, you know, the average man has a 30-year mortgage, two kids, 1.5 cars. I mean, do they think 
he doesn't need to know about that, maybe, or is it just... Well, I think they probably started out with mankind in mind. I'm not sure whether they have mankind in mind or themselves in mind at this point in time. That makes sense. Um, why don't you think people who perhaps work for the government don't come forward with, you know, proof, hey, this is what we're doing, you know? Well, if you work for the government and, you're, uh, and you've been told not to say certain things, you no longer work for the government if you go out and say these things. So if you want your job, you do what you're told to do. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so I, I guess that would kind of lead to the question, I mean, do you think there's some sort of like cosmic water gate? I mean, do you think there's some big secret that's getting ready to get burst? And, or? Oh, I have no idea whether there's any great big secret ready to burst or not, whether it's a things that have accrued and built or whether it's just a normal evolution or what. Has anyone ever come, you know, from the forward from either NASA or the government said, hey, you shouldn't talk about these things publicly. It's not it's not kosher, I guess. No, I've never had anybody from the government ever come forward and tell me I should not talk about it. This is the last set of questions here. Why do you think we haven't been back to the moon? Oh, we haven't been back to the moon primarily because of politics. We should have, we should have retained a senator by the name of Proxmire, who headed up some very powerful committees, had us destroy the Saturn V assembly line and cut up all the tooling, rather than produce, say, one Saturn V a year, and continue to have an occasional trip back to the moon. We would have benefited tremendously as a nation and as a world by doing this. We should have had long ago had a permanent station on the moon for doing scientific research. And we should long ago have landed a crew on Mars. Why do you think, first of all, why do you think he had the, the assembly line cut up? Destroyed? I don't know why Senator Proxmire did the things he did. He destroyed the supersonic transport. He destroyed the dinosaur program. He destroyed the Saturn V rocket. And he canceled out our trip to Mars for we were going to do a manned 81 Mars landing, which he managed to cancel. I don't know whether he was carrying a car and painted red from another country or whether he just, uh, in all good conscience, thought we should spend all our money on Wisconsin cheese. But he certainly was not a, a very... Uh, Big, I, I am not one of his fans, as you can tell. Let's talk about that. Sorry, please. guy said cheese. That that was great. That was great. Um, in that same vein, um, let's talk about the dinosaur for a second. It's something you bring up because I was doing an, an interview um, in I think it was the old Lockheed Martin, if I'm correct, boardroom, and there's a picture of what looked like. You probably know, obviously know more than I, I do about this. It was a it was a small model off in the corner, and it looked kind of like a very small space shuttle with the wings. It kind of had, I guess, inverted mm -hmm. wings. And I asked them, "What what was this?" And they said, "Well, it's a, it was a craft. It was, I guess, codenamed dinosaur." And, and mm -hmm. I was I either piggybacked or taken them in the upper atmosphere, and then let go. And apparently, it just went straight up into outer space, and then. Well, it was a vehicle that would fly like Mercury did in space, but instead of using a parachute for landing, it had uh, aerodynamic effect. It was a winged vehicle. In other words, an airfoil-shaped vehicle that would come in and land on a runway. And it was a worthwhile program, and I, <clears throat> I can't really fault the decision to, to cancel it totally because there was some conflict between it and Mercury and Mercury was a simpler program that uh, certainly got off the path and well ahead of Dinosaur and Dinosaur had a lot of delays and a lot of delays and, and uh, finally got to the point where there would be a conflict between it and Mercury um so you don't know why I guess they didn't they didn't want us to land on Mars and put it I mean, is there any other reasons you could think of? I mean they they didn't you know you know why not? I mean that that, that just doesn't make any sense. I mean you think Well when you say they uh, 
you're not talking about all the technical people who were involved in the Mars program and who couldn't be involved in the Mars program. There are a lot of technical people who firmly believe that we should have long ago been on Mars and that we definitely need a manned mission to Mars now. But, I mean, one senator, you know, 20, 30 years ago saying we're not going to go. I mean, well, obviously, some politician may have a vested interest that he that this particular program may conflict with his vested interest. I see. The last chapter of questions here. Um, do you believe, we kind of covered this, but it was do you believe, I guess, there's life on, on other planets out there? Yes, I believe firmly that there's life on other planets out there. I think we'll find that there are probably hundreds of other planets that are habitated and that there are all levels of civilization. Some may be the same level we are, others that may be thousands and millions of years ahead of us in development. Why, in, in your mind, have they made contact with a select a, I guess, group of people or, or do you think there's any been contact that, that's gone on? Yes, I personally believe there's been a lot of contact that's gone on. Um, unlike yourself, I guess, do you think there are any other astronauts who may have had similar experiences with extraterrestrial craft? Yes, I know one or two have. Unfortunately, when you say astronauts have had contact, people think you're, you're having it in, in space. In space, to my knowledge, McDivitz was the only one that could be even a possibly an unidentified object. And other than that, all these stories that were made up and sold to people like National Enquirer and so on were totally fictitious. And I had, I've had any number of things written up about and reported by me of conversations I've had with extraterrestrials while in an orbit and and signings that I had in orbit and I was told to shut up about and all these kind of things that were made strictly to make money on print. What what happened to James McDivitt? I mean, do you know? Or? Well, I never could determine what it really was. The sun was glinting so on this metallic object. So brightly, you really couldn't tell from the pictures what it was or wasn't. And he never saw it again, so no one to this day knows. But there have been other astronauts who've had <coughs> contact from, a, you know, flying airplanes. Uh, um, why don't you think they've come forward? I mean, is it something they just don't want to talk about, or? Well, maybe they think there's not really that much to talk about yet until we get contacted by somebody. And... Speaking of that, what what do you think will happen to mankind when, when that ultimately happens? I mean, well, I think we'll see vast progress where we get the capability of really really learning you know people who can develop that kind of propulsion systems very likely have very advanced medical systems that can cure everything we have wrong with mankind today and you think it's just a technical technological advantage you, you will make or do you think there'll be some sort of conscious uh... I think we'll, we'll progress both technologically and in, the, in our consciousness yeah, maybe even a spiritual thing. People say, my goodness. Yes, I think very likely. Um, do you think there would be any type of hysteria? I mean, since you've seen one of these objects, I mean, do you think mankind is ready for such an incident now? or I think mankind is really pretty much ready for this now. I don't... There may be isolated cases of hysteria that are hyped and built up, but I think man on Earth here is pretty much ready to... Uh, or save man from somewhere else. If you could sum up your experiences with these craft in just a few sentences, what, what would you say? Great performance. <laughs> no, I mean, you could say, you know, while I was in Europe, I saw, you know, X amount of craft. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to look for, what I'm looking for some, some some log lines, you know, basically while I was in Europe, I saw X amount of craft or flying here or there. So how would you kind of sum that up in a sentence or two? Well, while I was in Europe, I saw some craft that certainly were very advanced over any of the craft that we have been flying and are presently flying. It would be nice to be able to build some of that kind of performance and to be able to go to the places where they go to. Uh, 
how we're going to take. Good. Okay, I just got a couple more questions. Um, if you were, I guess, if 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 a, if a uh, if a child was to ask you, have you do you believe in UFOs and have you seen one? What would you say to uh, an young impressionable mind? Yes, I do believe in UFOs. I believe that the, there's too many other places that people could habitate other planets to not be let them be habitable. And I believe that uh, I believe that they're coming here to visit us on occasion, or coming here for whatever reasons they're coming here. Um, is there anything on the subject that you haven't already said that you know, like to say for the first time? I mean, any kind of revelations or beliefs or misconceptions that are out there, you know, that people may have just said about you, or it's kind of a last chance to say something like that. Oh, I guess not. Revelations. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one question. Talking about going to Mars, what what do you feel uh, that a manned a manned mission? What what in your estimation, or, or or what was in the scientific community? What were some of the things that they thought that they would see and that, that they would experience or find there? Well, as far as Mars is concerned, the unmanned missions that we've put there, which have been great, they've been good ones really haven't told us definitely whether we, at one time, whether Mars was habitated by humans or not. And uh, it is not neither disproved nor proved either way. And there are many, many questions about Mars as far as what the water is, uh, the water situation from the past, that, that we think there are these, we know that these are probably big river washed gullies that are in it. Uh, do we have since we have ice caps on both the poles, do we have an area where the temperature is more suitable for life? Uh, will, will we find people there or not? I mean, there still is a possibility we might find somebody hidden in these caves back along these uh, gullies. And but the, <clears throat> the point is that on the lunar missions, the unmanned vehicles we sent up there sent, sent us back a tremendous amount of data before we ever sent a man on. But the man emissions yielded over a million to one yield over what the unmanned ones did just because the human brain still is smarter than that unmanned little vehicle. And the unmanned vehicle is only as good as the designer knows to make it. That little unmanned vehicle only asks for certain things that he's been told to ask for and if anything unexpected happens he doesn't have the capability of reason. <laughs> 